Ja, nu ska vi komma in i lite annat projekt då som både Helena Hansson har jobbat med som är i grunden industridesigner och nu är det doktorand på HDK och sen är det Evans Odiago jag måste öva på Miss Fahid igen, det är nice. eh, som är din partner i Kenya. Varsågoda, och nu kommer det bli en del på engelska. Uh, good morning. I'm sorry I'm going to do this in English. And I want to give us an African pick up. And this is, how, this is how we do it when we feel tired. Can we all stand up? It will only take like one minute. And I'm going to practice. We have uh, we have two animals, rabbit and rat, and we're going to catch them. <laughs> so if you catch a rat, then you sit down. So what this is what I'm going to do as we scare away the cold. Rabbit. So if it is bad to catch a rabbit, eh? Want to catch a rat? I mean, it's bad to catch a rat. Want to catch a rabbit to eat, eh? So if, you, if I do, then you go and I say rabbit, then you are in. If I say rat, then you catch, then you are out. Have you tried? Rabbit. Rat. Rabbit. Thank you. Before I take us through the slides, I want to give a talk about Zingira and how Zingira was founded. Zingira was founded in the year 2000, and uh, many people always ask me why, why and how it was founded. I am the founder of Zingira and bringing in um, two other like-minded people, Apollo and Carly. We shaped Zingira, and now Zingira is working with directly about 35 people and indirectly about over 250 people. The reason why Zingira was founded is because my background, my economic background was not that very good. Um, I was one of that kid who could live, hear the school bell ring for lunch and rush home hoping that you're going to find food only to realize that that lunch was not there. So I, want, I wanted to change, twist that kind of life because I realized many Many young people were sharing the same life. Uh, we started with the, with the making uh, paper. We crushing, taking a um, plant, taking plants and taking waste paper, crushing them together and uh, 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 using a simple technique, simple machine, lifting and making cards out of that paper. And that has grown over a number of uh, times when I when I met Apollo and I met Carolyn, who was working for a book binding store and agreed to work work in partners with me, and we grew that our first exhibition we did in 2002, and that was in Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, we sold about 10,000, and that was very very big and good money for that for the kick of Zingira. We started looking for like-minded youths from. Uh, from uh, within the community uh, who, are, who could uh, appreciate craft. And uh, grow, growing, we realized that uh, the, a weed in Lake Victoria was affecting, was, was, was affecting people living along the beaches of Lake Victoria. And, 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 and uh, from my slide, that is Kenya, and um, we realized that uh, in, in that in the first photo, we're having a fisherman who is traveling to to row his boat out of the weed. Beneath that weed, there is water, and they find it very hard to penetrate to the landing site. To the landing site to give to give uh, fish as a product to, the, to women. To do fish, to do fishing. I mean, I mean, to sell the fish. So uh, we realized that these are these are problems. And on this, this other side, 
uh, women, are, women, are, women are there selling fish from the fishermen. But who are, who are mainly affected by, by this weed in that lake were women. Because they, don't, they only sell fish, they don't fish. When men realize that uh, that landing site has been blocked by the weed, they go to another landing site that is not blocked by the weed. Then these women are left without an economic livelihood. So we say, let's come in and find a way of solving that problem, finding for them an alternative livelihood. And that is how the bath, uh, uh, hyacinth basket or hyacinth production uh, was given birth to. We've worked, we've worked, and, and that is another, another picture of a march of hyacinth covering the whole of a bigger part of Lake Victoria. It is a seasonal weed moving by the tides of the lake. Um, half qu a quarter of the year it is in the Kisumu Bay, another quarter of the year it is in the Homa Bay, Homa Bay Bay, another quarter of the year it goes to Nyakach, and that is how it moves in circle. So what, what, what we've done with our women, with the women that we're working with, we walk in each and every beach, we train women who are affected by the weed on how to process hyacinth to bring it into <coughs> Into, in, in, into a sub, a, a sub raw material like that. That is the weed, that is the, the stem of the weed. It has a root and it floats on water. Then the women cut the, the, cut the roots, cut the leaves, split it and make it into ropes. Then, we, then it is converted into a product like that. Um, briefly talk about paper making. Those are some of the things that we're doing. Briefly talking about paper making, um, just like I said, it's just crushing, crushing, uh, collecting waste paper from the, from, from the offices, then collecting the weed again. Like I've said, after uh, the stem, we use the stem for making ropes, we use the roots and the leaves, for, crush it to make paper, and from that paper we make the card. And some, yes, and some of the cards are, are, are down there. And we only have a simple machine that is, we call a meter. It is acting like a blender, which is, uh, its work is to, to crush the, the, the fiber into a liquid form. And we are, and, uh, then, we, then we also crush the paper into a liquid form. Then we mix them with it. We mix them at a given ratio. It could be 30, 70, or 50, 50. We've attained 50, 50 ratio of that mixture. Uh, then uh, it is using our wooden frames, we, we, we carry the wet paper and, and, and take it to the sun to dry. And the basket you're weaving is, um, is mainly, done, the, it mainly done by women who are having a bit of challenges in terms of um, uh, sourcing, for, sourcing for water hazards from the lake because it is carried with it crocodiles, snake, and even mosquito. So, so men, 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 men are helping them in harvesting, giving the fiber to women. Then the women are splitting the fiber depending on the size of the size of the rope, of, of the rope that is needed. We have ropes in four grades. There's A, B, C, and grade D. And, uh, and at the time of processing, where they are cut, cutting and slicing, that is the time where they determine what kind of grade they want to make. And grade, grade is coming about because of what kind of products we want to uh, put into, in, 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 into that particular rope. Like if you see, uh, some of the baskets have got thicker, thicker twines, some have got thinner twines. So for furniture, we, we even make furniture out of that particular material. For furniture, we use the thick, a very big rope, that is grade D. And uh, Zingira does not only do water has it, we do recycling. We, 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 we reuse unwanted material. We collect metal, we collect plastic, we collect food can, house fresheners, perfume cans, we collect rust, rusty wires and convert that into sellable products, products that can be, can be found back into, into, into our houses. We use bottle tops, like what she's showing, that, that is a, a product from bottle top and from waste can. 
and and uh, I I like the presentation from my able mother Antonio. Yes, and th there's a lot of similarity between uh, their culture and our culture. And to me, over a number of years, I've seen I've seen um, craft as a community building tool. I've seen craft as a as, as a as a tool that is is able to help even solving dispute dispute and conflicts within community. When people are sitting together, when people are sitting together to do quite a number of work, they talk, they understand each other, they have conflicts when it comes to sharing tools or sharing materials, and they find a way of solving this conflict during the process of uh, craft making. And in that table, uh, we are realizing that uh, we, are, we have uh, both uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, young and old, within, within that context, that are doing crafts out of hand. And to me, that is a powerful tool that brings people together. And that is another slide that is showing all the recycle, like the team. Uh, the, the, the beauty about the process is that um, waste is collected. We've got people that are, that are collecting waste, plastic, metals, and heaping them at a, at a particular center. And our work is to go there and assort the waste, uh, separate bad and good. Then uh, we, we clean the waste and shape them into different kind of uh, shapes as per what, would, what a client would need. But again, uh, we realize that now we are in the process of educating communities and households on how to sort waste so that it doesn't reach as very, when it is so very dirty. So we tell them that uh, we can separate plastic, metal in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in, in different containers. Now that is a, that, that, that is a picture. Um, on the fire, on the, fire the, uh, the briefcase is made out of a, 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 a spreadsheet of metal that was meant to be a bottle top. And uh, because of misprint, it was not used by the bottle top in company. So we get it from them and make products like, products like that. Some are painted, some are not painted. And on this other side, this, was, this one was our old design of basket. But when we met, when we met, uh, when we collaborated with Afroat, they, they changed that design uh, to the square basket without the handle, and this has, has become so very popular. Um, we started working with Afroat in 2013, uh, formally, uh, December, and uh, up until from that time to now, Afroat has, has placed an order of such like basket of about 450 pieces. So it, 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 it has grown in a number of times. I, I mentioned about um, a crusher, a beater, a, machine, a paper making machine. Um, that is the machine that I designed to crush, to crush the paper and crush, crush water hasses. Initially we were using the, the, the mortar and parcel, heating to separate the fibers. But that was tiring and that was time consuming. And that was making even our, our, our product a, a, a Cost, uh, costly. So we designed that machine to help us crush the, the, uh, crush the paper. And that is a, a spreadsheet of paper made out of water housing and waste paper that is already dried. And that was a, a photo taken during uh, your visit in 2011. 2011. Now, that, that is the process of, of water housing harvesting. Uh, uh, a, a man, uh, just like I mentioned, that this, this hassle is coming with all the dangerous animals, snakes, crocodiles, and men, because men are brave, uh, they can dare go and help women harvest this water hassle. And again, they know, they, I think most people, most men living along the beaches of Lake Victoria, they know, they know how to play games with, with those dangerous animals. I, can't, I don't know how to say that. But that technically, that is how it is. It is harvested. It's just plucked, put by the by the shore of the lake, and and on the other side, the hasid is washed because hasid is known to be collecting all the dirty dirtiness from the from the water. It is a water purifier. 
So when you, when you get it, you have to wash all the mud and uh, slice, like I was saying, slice into, take off the root and take off the leaf. Then, uh, then from there, th there it is, uh, it is heaped to dry. Then the weaving takes place. And from that slide, again, we are seeing how people, how two can use, uh, can, can put same effort towards making one basket. And to me, that is a, that is a, a powerful tool for, uh, for communicating and for coming together as a community. It all involves uh, metal fabrication framework, and, and it all involves again the weave, the weaving coming, uh, to, coming together, and, and and it involves just bringing the whole women and uh, talk about this community. This is a community that uh, had a challenge of had a huge challenge on how to utilize water housing. Uh, then. Um, at this time is when we partnered with the with with, with Daconia, um, to come and train this community. The first day, this is this is very interesting. Um, the first day when I was called to train, I met about fifty-four women in this forum. It was a very big number, and uh, because they thought that that craft is nothing, the next day that I was going to train, I w I was only left with two women. And to me, because I'm used to interacting with community and I know how, I know the dynamics of co challenges of community, I told these two women that we have to start with you. Because the two women that I was left with were craft women. They used to, they've been doing uh, mats out of water reed. So, uh, and, and again, that has taken a, another twist that now within this community that I first, uh, craft was rejected, we have 30 women making, processing ropes and making baskets for Afroat. So they realize that, that craft does not just earn a living to them. Craft is a platform for socializing and solving their problem, both financially and, and, and socially. Now, it, all this does not come without challenges. We are meeting rough roads, or when I talk about, uh, we are meeting Kenyan roads, eh? very bumpy roads when you are doing all this. We have leadership issues within these communities that we, we every day try to struggle with. One time, and leadership issues is, are coming as a result of mistrust. One time somebody, a, a, a leader was given money to go and organize for an exhibition. That money did not go into good cause. And that that made most women, most women or young young persons, to run away from the group or from from craft activities. And that and that is evident when I went to Osiri and I, when I went to that particular women group, and I realized that there was a huge challenge with the leadership issue. And I told them that uh, let's let's re-energize this group and find a way of uh, bringing uh, training our leaders uh, into into a proper platform where we can work. And build trust, and our style of of, of uh, grooming leadership, and this is in, this is in Kenyan context, is um, we don't we don't pay salaries in every activity they do. It, if you if you make we realize that giving handouts will make them relax and not work. Now what we do is if you make that basket, you are paid for that basket. Whether you are a leader or not a leader, whether you are the president of that group or not president of that group, you must work to earn. And that, for a number of years, has seen as has seen uh, that, uh, the number of two women coming rising to thirty, and not just that community. We are working in a catch community where we are we have about one hundred and five women from different different groups, and they are coming in because at least they feel the value of sitting together. And they can, they, they know they are earning a living from what they are doing, and their efforts are appreciated. We 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 still have record keeping as a as a problem because we are working with people 
who have got very low background of education, but again, we are we adapting a style of uh, of uh, giving them a best way and and, and uh, low a best way of keeping record which is not so educated oriented. And again, we had a, a problem of uh, uh, distributing money because the community that I'm coming from, I'm, I'm coming from, doesn't have the banking system. But uh, we are privileged to have a, a, a phone service provider that has built a platform that can assist in transacting money, small money from one person to another person. If you are calling it ten pesos, maybe some of us are aware of that. Where, where you can transact money using your phone, and that is the platform that we are embracing now within this community because they cannot afford the charges for the bank, but they can afford this platform. So if, if, there, is any, if there is any money that we need to transact, we send it to, to the group leader, and the group leader distributed among, among the members. Uh, then we have uh, market access, which is a challenge, and we are really trying to penetrate that. And that is one of the reasons why I'm here to meet uh, uh, to meet uh, some of our market partners. And quality. When I walked in here and I was told that this is done by hard and that is done by hard, and I told myself, we are, our quality is still lacking. Yes, it is really still lacking, and we struggle with this. And uh, and and. and uh, Elena will bear me witness. When it started, it was so pathetic. Most of the products were rejected, eh? and my community did not give up. We are, we've attained this quality now, but we believe it's not the best quality. We work with wood, and we know it, our wood is so very pathetic. We work with metal, it, is not, it hasn't met that standard, and quality and finishing is a very hip thing. And to me, I think those are some of the lessons that we can, we, we can learn we, we can learn uh, amongst ourselves. So, thank you. <laughs> okay, this was, um, thank you very much. This is, this is an introduction to, to Sangia and the, the Kenyan context. And um, this project, is about a collaboration between Swedish actors and Kenyan actors. And we have talked a lot about, during this seminar, about getting together, get organized. And this is an attempt to get organized two different continents, two different cultures, and to find the similarities, not talk about the differences, but what resources do you have in Kenya? that we can bring into this collaboration? And what resources do we have in Sweden that we can bring in to this collaboration? So the project is about a platform for a collaboration and the basket is one of the results. It's one of the physical outcomes. But it is the knowledge and the resources we have put into the basket that is the, what this project is about. And my background is industrial design and most of the people talking about design maybe think of somebody giving shape to an object. But in my case, I look at my role as I'm crafting uh, linkages and connect people. I'm the connector and I use the basket as the one, the thing that brings people together. And it's not even me that has designed the basket. Originally it was designed by you and Afroart that later come into the process, they redesigned it to suit the Swedish market because we needed an access to the market. So I have been linking Afroart to Singira and the basket is the connector. That's, they talk through the basket and I support them in discussing why should it be like this or why should it be like this. And working as a designer with this specific role in this means that uh, I have to rethink my own role. Uh, if I should work with Kenya, I have to, I cannot have too many ideas myself. I have to adapt to the local culture. I have to have plans about visions about the future and I have to, but things have to happen now, but they also have to happen later on. It's a process that 
grows over time. So us Swedish people coming to Kenya, we want to see results very quickly, but collaborations and development takes time. And development is also an ongoing process. And when I step into your existing development process, I have to adapt to that and build on to what is already ongoing. I can't change this too much because then I cut their development. I have to adapt and see how can this grow on? How can we support each other so it can grow slowly and develop over time? And I see this as a kind of patchwork. We talked about influences from other parts. I, th I see it as a patchwork with different resources. During different times you bring in what you have and it goes on. It's an ongoing process. Um, my research perspective is something called frugal innovation. Um, I see it as re innovation based on resource constraints. When you have nothing, what can you do? If you have small resources, what can you do? How can you match small resources so it can become something bigger? Um, and some researchers, they, they define it as means and ends to do more with less for more people. And I think this is what SLOID is about. It's doing more with less, but maybe what you should think of is how can we do this for more people? Involving more people or reaching out to more people? So we have to think about how can we involve many people in this process and in this kind of innovation processes. And frugal, it's a very special word, but frugal means sparing, thrifty, simple and plain. So it's about uh, the, the less you can have, the, the smallest resources you have. Um, and Research, research show that in innova innovation um, depend on which context and which culture you are in. So when we think about innovation, it's maybe a technical outcome. A new an iPhone or a car or a light bulb. But it, in innovation in, in emerging markets, like for example in, in Africa, um, what we usually call development countries, for example. They have a lot of constraints uh, and they also have institutional voids. And that is because the culture have been uh, colonized by people from outside that has broken their already existing structures. So they have to rebuild these structures. And in this process of reconstruction, there are, there are no institutions. So we have to be aware of that, that the culture in Kenya is more of an informal structure. And maybe I have seen that this basket maybe can be an infrastructure or like instead of an institution, this is what, this is the institution or this is the infrastructure. So the project is an infrastructure where, when there is no institutions. But the very interesting thing is that, and that has helped us a lot, is that the technology, mobile phones and internet are existing and that makes it possible for us to communicate. And also, as you said, um, you can pay your craftsmen through the payment system based on mobile technology. So they actually had a switch, you know, switch that's the original was introduced in Kenya. So they are like, I think it's 65% of all the transactions is through the telephones. So, you know, there is different kind of innovations processes ongoing. And to me, it's very important that when I define innovation, it's, it's a process. It's not really an outcome, it's a process by which ideas are transformed into practice. You have an idea and you try out how to do it. That is the innovation process. And innovation, it's a combination of already existing elements. 
what happens if I do this and this and combine it? Or I get inspired by this, I get inspired by the Swedish folk direct, and I make a carpet out of it. That's a kind of innovation process. And why I, I want to work with innovation and craft and design is that I, I think maybe that we need to put on these glasses that craft is an innovation process. We should, uh, we should uh, talk about it as an important ingredient in our cultures to develop ideas. And um, the innovation might be something that can change the perspective on craft and cultural heritage as something that was the old fashioned and left behind. It should be something that actually should be brought in as a new way of living, a new way of, of, of uh, changing things. Um, and as I said before, the, the project, the, in this case the research project, there is something before the project starts. And that is the whole knowledge of what Singira and other people are already doing. And then I have the opportunity to become a research student and, and do stuff. And that is during a certain period of time. And then I need to secure what is happening after. How can we trigger processes that could, could, that could be developed? So the basket process that we start leads to certain activities. And that becomes certain outcomes. So this is, the basket is one of the outcomes, you can say. The basket becomes something else that generate new ideas. So an innovation is never separated. An innovation gives processes, I mean triggers that can trigger new processes to start. And I think this is what has really inspired me, that I see it as parallel processes. I can work with a basket, I can work with a rope making machine, I can work with natural dyeing as parallel processes and you interact in between and you can involve different people in these processes. And <clears throat> also when you talk about innovation, we usually think of it as technical, technical outcomes, but it can be cultural as well. This is a cultural innovation. A plant was brought from Amazonas to Lake Victoria. It became a threat. Then somebody saw an opportunity and innovated. And this is a new culture. It's a, it wasn't there before. This craft was not present before Evans invented it. It's a new plant. It's a new technique. This is not a long history historical tradition. This is a new tradition of craft that is taking new steps. Um, the eco, sorry. <laughs> and, and it's also an economical innovation because through this people started to earn money. And as I said before, it's also institutional. It brings people together and create these you know, platforms. And I think this for me, this institutional and economic, I mean, they are all mixed together. You can't really separate it. But this can be something to have in mind. When you look at your craft, what kind of, is it a technical innovation? Or what is it, how can I define my own work? And what do I appreciate most? And maybe I have to think about more, how can it be economical in the future to be able for me to earn a living from it? <laughs> yeah, there is a process, we can go into it later on. But this is actually what the basket is. This is the institution. Um, the basket is what brings people together. Everyone has a stake in the basket. Um, Thingira, the community-based organization, they, have, they are interested in the basket because that is a potential outcome. Um, the, um, me, as a designer researcher, I have money from 
CEDA, the International Development Cooperation Agency, through something called Mistra Urban Future, which is like looking at uh, urban development in uh, all over the world. And they pay me to be a researcher to, to change the world. So I'm interested, I use the basket to change the world. That's my way of, I do it through the collaboration. And um, in this project we have worked with a faith-based organization, a development aid organization called Diakonia. Uh, and they act also as a kind of platform, because through them, we can work through them. So we, Xingira go in and train women through Diakonia. We can start an entrepreneurship program where Singira go in as an expert and train them. Um, I, um, they have local partners that can support Singira in how to organize themselves. The craftsmen are interested in, they are important resources because they are the producers and from this they can get an outcome. And AfroArt, which is the, today the, the market for this, they are interested because then they get uh, products for, their, um, for the market, but they also are part of this community. So for them it's not that they are just a company, they are part of something bigger. And we have also, for example, worked with our environmental artist, in this case, Jeanette Schering, and she had brought in the resources of how could we develop the fiber and dye it so it gets even more valuable or, or can, can be changed in, in different ways. And also for, like, like you were talking about, the being lonely as a craftsman. Now you can be part of something bigger. So, Jeanette Schering as an artist or craftsman go into this and become part of something bigger. And then it's fun, you collaborate, but you are expert in what you are doing. So you don't have to be the designer if you don't want to be the designer. You are the craftsman, you are bringing your resources. I think it's also very, very important to talk about the non-human actors. The technology, the equipment, the tools, they help us in the communication, or how to improve things. So it has, it, it's not only human resources, but material-based resources that are also important resources that we should bring in. Um, we don't have so much time. <laughs> okay, uh, it's like going backwards. Uh, should I just uh, rush through this? Yeah. It's like uh, going backwards. Um, I came to Kenya in 2011. I have a background as an industrial designer and I was working as a teacher at the Design School of Gothenburg. We were invited to come to Kisumu uh, on a study visit through my professor that has been working in Kenya. And this is from our guest house and I was standing looking out and somebody said, that's Lake Victoria. And I said, what? That's a swamp area. <laughs> so that was my first meeting with the water hyacinths. It was just, had just taken over the lake. And I thought, oh goodness, we have to do something about this. And I visited some programs hosted by Diakonia. And I could see these people are really taking care of this and uh, you know, do, do something. But I could see that maybe the products were not that... I realized they didn't have market. They were just producing for the program. I mean, it was a development program and what was happening after, nobody really knew. And, and there were really no market connections. So I thought, if this should be sustainable over, over time, you have to know more about uh, the customers and how to build up the production that really works. To me, this was more of an occupation. But then I, then I came to Singira a few days later and I could see that you had a structure that I was lacking and you had the organization and you already had the market, but you said we still lack the market access. 
So I thought, what if, if I went into this and we could bring in the market somehow, could this be a possible way? So actually already since 2011, I had some kind of idea of would this be possible and everyone said it's impossible. But it showed to be possible because me and Evans connected immediately. We exchanged Facebook addresses and one and a half year later I got an offer to become a doctoral student in Kenya through Mr. Urban Futures, funded by SIDA. And I contacted them and said, can we do something together? And after about, we tried, there were a lot of uh, different uh, uh, constraints that, um, that, that made it difficult to, to find a way to collaborate. But after we, uh, I got contacted actually by Diakonia and asked, because they have heard about that we were starting a collaboration. So they asked, we are actually doing a craft program and we're interested in bringing in people uh, to work on the high scenes. Are you interested? And I said, yes, we are interested. And so we built up this, we built up this kind of alliance where we brought in different people into this. And Afro, as I said, was one of them. Because I saw that a partner, a market partner, uh, could help us identify um, what, I mean, that help us to, to, to define what the basket should be and, and, uh, um, and all the costs and everything. So I knew that this was not the solution to bring in a company, but it would be a help for us to start to put the basket in the middle and start discussing what could this be. And we found out that, for example, that it needed to have another shape. We couldn't use the baskets with the handles. It would never sell in Sweden. So they redesigned it. So if you talk about this transfer of, I mean, is this really, are we colonizing the Kenyan tradition by changing shape? Or are we just transforming it into something else? And where is the Swedish design? And where is the Kenyan design? I mean, this is kind of a mix. And we were extremely concerned about the design should be based on the existing uh, resources, not, not too much different from what you have, because otherwise you have to reorganize the whole knowledge that you, that you had. So for us it was important to not to make too big steps. Um, and the, this, this collaboration also helped us to uh, to identify that it was really, I mean, they made it stackable so you could, so you could uh, more easily transport it, uh, ship it, but it also made us aware of that the rope making was actually very, very expensive. So the basket was maybe the prices were too high, and we had to argue and, and discuss how can we simplify things. And in that process, that kind of negotiation process we find out new ideas, how to, do, how to do things. So, if I should try to round up this, I would say that by, <clears throat> by working together with others, you have to let go of yourself and your own ideas. You have to start mixing it together. And, and that is a conversation and a negotiation and verhandling. And you have to be willing to go into that negotiation because you can't just say I want to do like this but we should collaborate. Collaboration is about being equal and find the similarities and where can we connect. 
So when we talk about getting together, you have to look for the similarities and don't think too much about what is different. And you have to have the motivation to step into this new collaborative room. And this is maybe the mindset that I would like to I mean, invite you to, that what, is, what are your resources that you can bring into a collaboration like this, or into Antonia's collaboration, or into Sethi Glantan? Think about and, and nurture your motivation and the skills, and be professional. Be a professional collaborator. Bring in your resources into the common collaboration. And be open and waste time because collaboration takes time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, we don't have more time, so. <laughs> okay. Jag tror att många av oss har fått jättemånga tankar och funderingar och jag hoppas också att ni ska ha med det här för framtiden självklart på alla sätt. Och jag hoppas också att Säteglanta kan vara en resurs på olika sätt att kunna vara ett forum för att kunna diskutera det här. Eh, jätteroligt att vårt första Säteglanta forum har avslutats. Vi skulle ha haft en liten diskussion men jag tror att vi är ganska mätta på intryck. Så att vi avslutade och dessutom fick Bosse dra med Antonia, så var det också. Eh, samarbete tycker jag är intressant. Nu har vi två eh, organisationer här, en från Bolivia och en från Kopenhagen. Jaha, okay. Som har tagit upp det här med att man samarbetar mycket i grupper. Och jag tänker på, det är kanske är någonting vi ska fundera på här. Att det kanske är också en kunskap som vi kan behöva med oss. Att vi kanske ska sammansluta oss på ett annorlunda sätt. Eh, jag har ju så här mantra då när det gäller hantverk. Och det är ju då en av de här kvinnorna som började på 1800-talet. Som Henrik nämnde i början av eh, slutet. Så, hon var verksam på 1900-talet i början. Och så var med i den här också starten av hemsflygsrörelsen. Men hon sa då, jag kan inte orda grant, men ändå. Hantverket ska leva i den tid vi lever i, annars är det död. Det tycker jag, det har jag som ett mantra. Man ska vara mån om sin tradition, vi ska vara stolta över det. Vi ska undersöka vårt kulturar, vi ska se hur vi kan förena det med andra länders kulturer. Men vi måste också verka i den tid vi lever i. Men det vill jag avsluta de här dagarna. Så, tack ska ni ha.